So praise God. Um, it's great to see you. Um, I've heard some funny stories about the fast already. So, and we're into the, the last week of the fast, and we break our fast next Sunday. We'll have um, some fellowship, a bit of a celebration, and, and we'll, we'll have something to, to eat as well. Um, so you're welcome to stay behind and celebrate with us. But I believe the fast has already made a, a big difference. I can see it, I see things happening. And so uh, last week I started teaching on prayer and fasting for revival, and I never finished, so we're going on to part two for, of that. Um, but I've titled the message, because we're kind of going to get on to this, Show Me Your Glory. Show Me Your Glory. And so last week we talked about our prayer, because it's prayer and fasting, and we said that we are all called to be intercessors, because some people think, well, I'll do this, I'll serve here, I'll serve there, but the prayer guys, they can go and pray, they can intercede, they can supplicate, they can do all that, and we need to know that we are all intercessors. And to intercede for somebody simply means to pray on behalf of somebody else, to stand in the gap for somebody else. So we can all do that, amen? amen. We can all be intercessors. We, can, we, we talked about praying harmoniously, praying as one, one voice, one mind, and aim, according to Amos 3.3, 3, to be in agreement. And the most vital time to be in agreement is when we pray in our prayer meetings or when we're together praying, be in agreement. Because prayer will produce a harvest. Prayer will, in due season, if we do, will not faint, prayer will produce a harvest. And persistent prayer is the other thing. We, I've often got lost hope because I thought I've, 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 I've thought I've persisted in prayer. But really, God, it's like that, pray without ceasing. It's like getting that consciousness of you can pray all the time, all day long, if you like, even when you're sleeping, believe it or not, you can dwell, before you go to bed, you can meditate on the Word of God and dwell on that Word, and it will feed you all the way through the night. If you're prone to bad dreams and nightmares and things like that, try reading God's Word before you go to sleep at night, and dwell on that, amen? And then finally, we said, when you pray the Word, speak the Word back to God, so, because the more we speak it back to him, the more he says, yeah, I know that Haley's got this. She, uh, she's got it because she's talking it back to me. So I know that she's catching it. So it's powerful when we speak God's word back to him. Amen. And if we keep reading our Bibles, we will understand them. A lot of people are very, very good at pointing out contradictions in God's word. But if we will keep on reading before the verse that pops up on your social media feed or your daily devotion or whatever you get on your phone, and after the verse, we will begin to understand our Bibles. Because all we get all day long is little snippets of verses on our phones. And we need to then go to our Bible and read before and read after. Amen. And so um, keep on doing that. And I believe that all of this, when we start doing this, we're going to start seeing more happening in the kingdom, and revival is going to spring up. So revival, revival is, in, is, is in the heart of the believer. God is completely sovereign, and revivals that happened in the Hebrides and in the Welsh valleys and all places over the world, yeah, God had ordained times for those things to happen, and He worked through people that, that prayed those revivals in. Revival is in, the, is in our hearts. And we have a very, we have a very, uh, we have the responsibility and the power to bring God's kingdom on earth sooner or later. We can accelerate things by our, the way we are as believers, or we can cause them to be delayed. And so we want to move in lockstep with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit. He says, this is the way that you should go, walk ye in it. And so the more we turn our lives and our focus to Him and we are obedient to Him, we begin to start see things happening in God's time. So we've, people have been praying for revivals for generations. 
And are we close to a revival? You know, but where does it start? It will start in our heart first. And it's like Moses. You know, Moses uh, was, was God's man to lead his people out of Egypt. And um, here's Moses found in the bulrushes by Pharaoh's daughter, and he's raised up in Pharaoh's home. But somehow God knew that Moses had the heart to do what needed to be done. And so Moses, Moses begins to grow up, and eventually he sees one of his, one of his people, because he was a son of Levi, being mistreated. And you'll know the story, he kills the Egyptian. And um, he kills the Egyptian, and Pharaoh hears about it, and then he, he takes off, because he knows this isn't going to end well. And in the meantime, as it's building up to that, the very people that were being oppressed and that he, want, he had a heart for turned against him, you know? So Moses, he's, he's got this heart for God's people, and eventually God speaks to him, the burning bush experience, and says, this is what I want you to do for me, and you have to bring my people out of captivity. And then he, he goes back, and then we know there's the plagues and everything else, all of those things. But Moses had this heart after God, and uh, even though he tried to get out of it and say, you can't use me, I stutter, I'm really not up to the task, God knew it was him. So one person, whether it be a revival or leading people out of prison or captivity, God, God only needs one person to do that. And you could be that person because there's people in prison cells all over the place. People are in prison cells within their own home, in their own minds, in their own hearts. Amen? And so that, that can happen. And eventually, God says to Moses, I'm going to speak with you face to face, as it were. You know, this, is, this was the powerful thing. God said the first time Moses went up Sinai twice, but the first time he went up with 70 elders and with Aaron and her, and God said to them, that's far enough. You're not coming any further, but Moses, you come up higher. You come up further. I've got something that I need to share with you. And, um, you know, um, doesn't that stir your heart? You know, that Moses was, had... had, had um, was in a place in his being where he said, no matter what happens, I'm going to do what needs to be done. And for that reason, Moses went into the glory of the glory cloud. He went into the glory cloud of God. And we talk about a revival, and I think, is God's, does God's glory have anything to do with the revival that we're going to experience? I believe it does. And so that is a little bit of what I want to speak about quickly this morning. Does it have end? Does God's goodness and His glory? Because when Moses was there, what did God say, God say to him? If you come here, I'm going to. Sh Moses says to God, "Show me your glory." But God says to Moses, "I'm going to sh show you my goodness. I'm going to pass before you, and so you can see my goodness." so that you can see who I really, really am. And so, ah, this is good because I think it starts to like set us up. Like, So what, how do we usher in the glory of God? And I know we have the presence of God here, but we, we love to sing a song, Shekinah Glory, which, which is, talks about the, the weighty presence. Uh, yeah, yeah, like a, like a, like something heavy on your shoulders that almost that almost pushes you down, you know. And and whenever we are down, you know, this is the thing. Maybe the spirit is speaking here. When we are down, what does God always do? He stoops down to pick us up. Jesus came down to earth, and it was as if he stooped down to come and pick us up. So when the weight of God's glory comes, I don't think anyone will be standing up in here. I don't think we'll be standing because when, when we're standing, but when we're down, he can pick us up. When we're down, if we're on our knees, if we're on our belly, <laughs> if we're on our bellies, it's okay. We clean the floor. He can pick us up. He can pick us up. So I wanted to read this passage with you, with you quickly about um, how, how we know so, that revival is in the air or signs of revival. I want to quickly go through Acts chapter 2 verse, from verse 36. 
I'll read it once through completely. It says in the NIV, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, saying to the people, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his, me his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Hallelujah. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." The, that's the New Testament Acts pattern, really, of what a revival looks like. Amen? Before we have revival and during a revival, the first sign will be that there is an emphasis on Jesus, the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus. Amen? Peter is preaching to the crowd the very first part of that. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Amen? Jesus, Peter preached the name of Jesus right from that time. And when believers make Jesus, when we make Jesus our highest priority again, revival will come. We have to emphasize Jesus. Amen? It becomes our highest priority. So when Jesus occupies front and center of our lives, amen, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 25, um, what did King David, Peter's talking about King David. King David says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. Always, Christ was always front and center. And, and when we keep Jesus Christ front and center, that helps us because um, I know um, anyone know they put these blinkers on racehorses. And the blinkers are designed, my wife will tell me if I'm right or wrong here, but they're, I believe they're made so that the horse will maintain focus ahead and it won't be distracted by anything on the side. And the other reason they wear these blinkers is because the horse can't be, I might be wrong here, spooked. You know, so there's less to make. So when we keep Jesus front and center, we do not get spooked jumpy, afraid, because we are keeping Jesus front and center. thought that was a good illustration of the horse with the blinkers. Amen. And so these things, when the crowds around us want to distract us, the corrupt generation, keep Jesus front and center. Hebrews 12, 2, the Berean version, which is a great version of the Bible, the Berean version, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so we keep our eyes on Jesus. So the next sign of revival is repentance. People begin to change direction and they repent for their past life. In verse 37, it says, when the people heard of what Jesus did, they were cut to the heart. They were, you know, I love the, 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 this, Jesus is the blade, the balm, and the bandage. That you first, the cutting comes first. We're always cut and then there's the balm of Gilead. And then there's the wrapping up and the bandage and the restoration, and that comes in. Is there anyone here being through a cutting time in their life? Yeah. yeah. And some people even have even been physically through a cutting time in their lives. Jesus, will, will, Jesus is in the business of binding people up. Amen. And so um, repentance, 
People change their lifestyles. In revival, everything changes. They not only walk away from patterns of sin. You know, we often describe sin as being habitual. It's a pattern. It's something that we keep on going back to. It's like, how am I going to break the cycle of this? Well, that's, it's possible to break that cycle when we repent and walk away from it. And they turn their attention away from the petty entertainments of the world, and they bring their attention onto the kingdom of God. So the things that previously dominated our time and took up our time, we can, we can it, now we might think, how can I ever do that? I can't give up my this or I can't give up my that. The kingdom just becomes more important. It just somehow becomes more important, and these things fade away. And so when people are in a, str in a violent struggle to give up on sin, the best thing to do is to keep Jesus front and center. And, and, and God, has, God is gracious, amen? When we, when we make the same mistake again and again and again, he forgives us. But he will help us out of that pattern of sin, amen? So the world gets less of our attention and the kingdom gets more, amen? In revival, our burdens are for people that don't know Jesus. Another sign, a burden for the lost. Amen. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off. The burden we have for the lost. Because when we, you, remember back to the day you were saved. It's like, how could I not, I remember how I felt. How could I not share this with somebody else? You know, I remember when we were kids growing up in South Africa, you know, we used to go on these long road trips, you know, and sometimes we'd stop at the side of the road and they'd have pawpaws and mangoes and bananas and stuff, but sometimes they'd have guava rolls. A guava roll was this like rolled fruit thing and you go in the back of the car and Denise and Gary would be there and you're like, I'm not, this is so good. I'm not sharing it with you guys. And so a, a fight would ensue. I'm sure everyone's had the kids in the back of the car and it's like a Barney's going on because, you know, you're not sharing your chocolate log with me or whatever. But, but we've known the goodness of God. And so our self-life wants to hold on to that, but selflessness wants to give it away. Revival is about spreading things around, spreading, spreading the good news and spreading things around, amen. And so <clears throat> when we are aware of our, the way we were lost and struggling, you know, that's a reality check for us. Other people feel just the same way, amen. And we if we fall into that false sense of security and become content with letting other people struggle, we've got a, it's a reality check. People need help. And they need, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. They need our help. They need love, love more than, than just in word, but love in deed, which is what we do at the Heat Hub. We do it's love in action. When you leave here today, put love into action. Amen. So it's having a burden for the lost. And you know, a burden, you know, a burden is something that is a heavy responsibility. That's what a burden is. It's a heavy responsibility. When we take a moment, kick back and think, oh, hang on, the weight of the responsibility. That's why pray Pray for one another. Pray for our praise team. Pray for our volunteers. Pray because sometimes it's, we would want to shrug that burden of responsibility off. Oh, life would be so much easier if I didn't have this to carry. But you know what? Just the way Jesus, he endured. And he will see you. He will help us to endure. Amen. So Another sign of revival, wait for this one, there's an increase in salvations, right? <laughs> so along with that burden, people suddenly begin to give their lives to Jesus. We carry those burdens for people and they begin to give their lives to Jesus. So let pray that that pattern continues, people giving their lives to Jesus. The other sign is people become passionate about praying. People become passionate about... So verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Amen. Revival or pre-revival, I think you'll see the passion to pray will go up. 
People will just want to pray more. They pray at home. They pray wherever they can meet together. The passion for prayer goes up. Amen. God will begin speaking to you in your dreams and in visions through the night, in the morning. Amen. And so manna in the morning, you know, the, the morning is often, the, some people, are, I'm a night owl, you know, I'm not a morning person, but there's fresh manna every morning. If we just wait on the Lord in the morning, then, and, and go to him at night, then we'll have peaceful sleep. And I think so many people struggle in the sleep department, weigh, things weigh on our minds. And I believe that this prayer helps us to give all of that back to God Cast all your cares onto me. Cast all your cares onto me. So if you've got, if you want to be carefree, I don't use that in the wrong way, cast your cares onto Jesus. Amen? So, amen. And when we pray, we become conscious of God being there more often and hunger for the word. word, word. I was so encouraged this morning. I was speaking to someone upstairs who's on their fast, and it's like, I just find I'm reading God's word more. It's all set up. It doesn't matter if you use your phone. That's fine, you know. If you use your phone and your Bible, but there's more of a hunger for God's word. There's more of a hunger to study it more, amen, and to listen to preaching and teaching, amen. God's presence, another sign of revival, God's manifest presence begins to appear, amen. So, Everyone was filled with awe, verse 43, at the many wonders and signs performed by the, uh, the um, apostles. Amen. I believe that God's presence becomes much more obvious in revival. I've heard stories of revival where revival has broken out in places. And people have said that there was a tangible presence of God. Now, whatever you de um, decipher that to be, you'll know when you're in it. I believe. I, we've had wonderful times here. There have been times here where I'm sure the praise team have been here and have been like, well, we did praise and worship this morning. We, we'd done it. And I'm, sitting, I'm standing there bawling my eyes out. You know, the presence of God, if you're open to the God's presence, He will come where you are. He will work right where you are, where you stand, you know. And so um, th that's something that God's manifest presence comes down. And when God's presence is, is wherever you are, healings take place, deliverances take things be other things begin to happen. Amen. And so what else happens during revival? People become more generous towards the kingdom. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Amen. So um, the kingdom of God is increased as we all bring our increase together to make the work of the ministry work, to make the, the, our heat hub work, to make whatever youth outreach. On the 2nd of February, we begin YUC in the Bridge Kincaidston. 2nd of February, we open, so we pray for that housing scheme of Kincaidston, that the 2nd of February, as we open youth group down there, that there will be just floods of young people. I hope the guys can handle it down there. Pray for that. And so we pray for a revival in our youth. Thank God. Pray for all the young people in our congregation as well. And that's like most of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one. Amen. So they began giving to the work of the Lord wherever there was a need. Now, don't get that. They didn't start giving to organized crime, okay, or um, immoral uh, behavior or anything like that. But they began to give where they seen a genuine need. They gave, they met the need with what was needed. So sometimes money isn't always what meets the need. Sometimes Food isn't always what meets the need, or clothing. Sometimes it's other things. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. Rise up and walk. These are the things that, so we trust the Holy Spirit. If there's a need, how can I meet the need? And so many times we, we just think in, in, we think so much in two-dimensionally. And the Holy Spirit works in a 
bigger dimension, the supernatural realm, and we're like, if only I knew. I'd like to show a video to you all sometime. It's called Strangers. And it's about how this guy at the beginning of the video, which is about five minutes long, it gives his life to Jesus. And through a series of meetings with different people, it comes all the way back to a single person who started the chain of events that led to this young man being saved. But they never, even though they passed one another in the street, they never met and they never knew that that is where my salvation came from. We're talking about three, we're talking about the supernatural dimension, okay? So we never, if, sometimes it's like, I can't see how this is going to work or what this is for. It seems so illogical, Lord, but if we will trust, amen? So uh, we're nearly there. A sign of revival, people want to be together more often. There's a greater frequency of corporate get-togethers to pray and to worship. So pray and worship more of that. So every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes. So in the church and in their homes, okay? That's what began to happen. Things begin to increase. Whether you're in the coffee shop or the restaurant or whatever, you can pray in a coffee shop. We can pray in the restaurant. We can, do, we can do these things, amen? So there's increased fellowship among, in revival, you will, we will all have more fellowship together. Don't groan. <laughs> It'll be good fellowship, amen? amen? God, God, God's people will experience a greater love for one another that draws them together and it will attract the unbeliever this is how we know you have, uh, what, oh, there's a song, love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Amen. And these are the things that really shine out and attract people. So um, I was going to say, put your hand up if you came to church because you, you just met a Christian who just shone in your, in your life. And that attracted you to, to the Lord. Anyone meet anyone like that? I know lots of people like that. Yeah, um, growing up as well. Do you just remember these people? They, they were a bit like Moses. Everywhere they go, they just shone, you know? And you remember them. Um, even our Sunday school, our, our kids' church um, teachers from 1978, 79, I remember them vividly um, because they were just such a beautiful shiny couple. And uh, is, that, is that even a thing? They were just shining all the time. They just loved people. And so praise the Lord. So what else happens? We have favor with the community. When revival comes, we have favor with the community. They praise God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. They had enjoyed favor with their community. Who did they not enjoy favor with? with the Sanhedrin, with the religious people. They didn't curry much favor with those guys, but by gosh, they, were, they got the favor of the people, the normal people. They got the favor of them as they began to see what was going on. So they had persecution coming from the one side and favor coming from the other. Be, make no bones about it. In the days ahead, even in 2024, who knows, there will be persecution, but there will be favor too. There'll be persecution on the one side and we shouldn't, we, we should expect it. And there will be favor on the other side. Amen. So whenever there's a revival, you'll always have people trying to pick it apart. There will all, scoffers and mockers will always rise up when God's doing a new thing. And they will try and say, well, is it really a revival? Is it really this? Is it really that? That's not my concern. Because a, revi a, a re revival will sustain itself. As, as we're obedient, it will sustain itself. Amen. And so having God's favor makes the persecution, it, it just falls into obscurity when you have the favor of God as well. And finally, I believe that re when revival comes, people will come into the work of the ministry. 
You'll have a calling on your life that you'll want to honor, that you'll follow. You'll have a mission to go on. Anyone want to go on a mission? <laughs> Amen. You'll, you'll, you'll sense God calling you to service. You know, and so I'm, I'm praying for that, whether it's ministry or if it's through your work life, you know, um, I, I got a book once, it's called uh, something along the lines of don't be a Monday morning atheist. You know, it's like as soon as you Monday morning comes, it's like you forget the weekend, you forget church. You, it's like we can consecrate our lives to the Lord even during work during the week, amen, for his ser ser service, amen. So all of those things are all, I believe, signs of revival. Some of them are precursors to revival, but all of that would be nothing without one thing that we need, and that is glory. We need God's glory, amen. So what is God's glory? God's glory is the thing that gives us life. It generates life. It's the power of God. God's glory, within God's glory, there's creative power, amen? In, in God's glory, what is dead can come back to life, and I want to show you that from the word, the word in Romans 6, 4. It says, therefore, and this is us believers, we were buried with who through baptism into death? We're buried with Christ through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the what of the Father, the glory. Christ was raised, to raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we should walk in newness of life. Amen? So, the glory in that context is the Greek word doxa, which is close to the word I mentioned earlier, kabod, which is the weighty presence of God. But basically what it, it's talking about, it's talking about the manifest presence of God. Whenever, when we have the manifest presence of God in our company, wherever we are, resurrection life is present. Amen? Resurrection life life is present. And so that's what his glory is. And Moses knew that I better have clean hands and a pure heart when I go into God's glory, because if I don't, you know, and God says that they will not come any further lest they die. So this, this brings us, and we're not going there today, to a place where we begin to realize that we're called to holiness. We're called to, to, to purity, and I think Pauline mentioned it in prayer this morning, to, cl to clean, to cleanse, to cleanse ourselves. Amen? So this is the kind of glory of God. So what is the goodness of God that God went before Moses says, just, I need you just, I'm going to put you here so that some of my, some of, I'm going to show you my goodness and I'm going to, my glory is going to pass before you. And we think, well, what is that? What was Moses expecting? Like a light show or something? What Moses actually got was the character and the attributes of God. I believe in that moment, he began to see God's person, his character, his splendor. Amen. And so uh, one way of putting it is that when God shows you, your, shows you his goodness, he shows you all the best things about him. When, I sh when God shows you my, if I'm going to be good to Lewis, I want to show him the best things about me. I'm like, I, this, you know, so that's how we show goodness to one another. God doesn't skimp on goodness. He wants to show us the best things about his goodness. So we need God's Spirit and His glory as part of revival. Amen? And if there's no glory, then there's just going to be nothing. It's just going to be emptiness, barrenness. So we need God's glory because it produces life. Amen? The wedding feast at Cana, what turned the water into wine? Let's go, go there in the Word. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 11, the, the story of the wedding feast, you know, water into wine, Jesus' first miracle, the beginning of his ministry. What does John 2, 11 say? The, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. glory. 
he, his manifest glory turned the water into wine. So we sometimes skip over the word glory, thinking it's just some, it's a word that we use. Um, we just, I think sometimes we need to, what does it really mean? In context, this is why I say if we read our Bibles more and study it more, we'll understand it more. So he thus revealed his, he revealed his glory, manifested his glory. And what happened once the glory was manifest? The, it goes on to say, his disciples believed. So all we need is God's glory, and then the people will believe. If, I mean, the disciples even had a hard time believing sometimes. But he's like, no, I've just manifest my glory right here in front of you so you can believe. When God's glory comes down, it takes us right back to the very start when he created the heavens and the earth, when he created the Garden of Eden, it was God's glory, he, his manifest presence, amen, all of these things. And so God's goodness and his glory are important because the goodness of God draws men to repentance. Romans 2.4, amen. The goodness of God leads people to rep repentance. So when we get the glory of God as our environment, I believe people repent and they come back to God. Amen. And so if you, you want some good reading, go and read Exodus chapter 24, the first time Moses went up Sinai, and then read Exodus chapter 33, that's the second time, and it tells you there, it makes a distinction between God's goodness and his glory and how he revealed that to Moses. It even says that the sight of God's glory was like a consuming fire. Now, um, you may, we may one day experience that, the glory of God like a consuming fire. Who knows? I mean, we know in the upper room, tongues of fire were on their heads, when they were there in the upper room. So don't limit God. Let's not say, let's not, this is what revival's gonna look like in Ayrshire. I think it's probably gonna, gonna blow our minds what revival will look like in Scotland, but we must come together and pray this in, amen? And so praise God for um, his goodness. And, you know, he's just, he's, we, we've got a saying in Scotland, pure quality. God, God, the qualities of God are just so immense. They, everything in this earth fades into, it's incomparable with God's goodness and his glory. Do you believe that? And eventually Moses, who's resisted so long and just question after question, eventually after the second time, Moses falls down, no more questions, falls down at God's feet and worships him. And that is where we'll all end up as a church one day. We're going to be in heaven, in eternity, worshiping the Lord. And we'll have a life, and we'll have a purpose, and we'll have a function. And it's not like clouds with people floating on them. It's not, it's, it's heaven is a real place where Jesus says, I go before you to prepare a place for you. So if you're in this place this morning, heaven is waiting for you, and there's a house there for you, and, and there's a gate to walk through, and there's a place to go, and there's things to do, and there's people to meet, and people to know, and there's, the, and there's, there's, there's angels everywhere. And, and God's word says that we will even have command over them, us, his creation that fell but thank God for Jesus who came and back down, came down and picked us up again. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for future content, please subscribe. And if anything spoke to you or was relevant to you, please leave a comment. If you want to find out more about the church, how to support the ministry or connect with us, then go to bridge-church.com. So until next time, thank you for joining us and goodbye.